I'm extremely pleased to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Giannis Kakadieris. Professor Kakadieris is the Hugh Roy and Lily Kranz Cullen uh, University Professor of Computer Science, Electrical and Computer Engineering, and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Houston. His research interests include cardiovascular informatics, biomedical image analysis, biometrics, computer vision, and pattern recognition. Giannis is one of the organizers of the Pumps and Pipes Initiative, a unique collaboration between academia and Houston's largest industries, medicine and oil and gas. Through the Pumps and Pipes organization, its members explore potential crossover ideas and new technologies. Giannis is also the founder and director of the UH Computational Biomedicine Laboratory, which seeks to equip scientists and physicians with the multitude of data sources available through today's technologies. The laboratory extracts and, extracts and analyzes relevant information in an unobtrusive, reliable, accurate, and timely manner. Tonight, you will hear about his efforts to glean useful information from cardiovascular imaging data. Importantly, this information provides new pathways to identify asymptomatic individuals who are at risk for cardiac events. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cacadieras as he tells us about improving our ability to identify heart attack risk. Honest. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I would like to dedicate this talk to the Honorable Ward Cassells. I actually met Dr. Cassells in the year 2000 when he was the Director of Clinical Research at the Texas Heart Institute. Dr. Cassells was a relentless innovator and pioneer in the area of predicting heart attacks. So Trip, this talk is dedicated to you. So, how many of you know a person that has had a heart attack? If I can have a show of hands. Indeed, no matter where I give this talk, more than 75% of the audience responds positively to this question. And the reason is that the numbers are staggering. There are about one million Americans that die because of heart disease, and this number is bigger than the total number of deaths from cancer, accidents, and HIV altogether. For example, this past weekend, we had about 3,000 Americans that had a heart attack, and half of them died, and they don't know what they died from, because cardiovascular disease is asymptomatic. But heart attacks are not a problem only in North America. Actually, it's a pandemic because we have more than 15 million heart attacks each year. And if you ask me what are the three most important problems in the world today, I will say poverty is number one, access to clean water is number two, and heart disease is the number three problem in the world that science and engineers might consider working. There is actually a myth. The myth is that heart disease is a disease of the developed world. But if you look in the statistics, by the year 2020, 75% of the deaths will take place in low and middle income countries. But let's see now how do we predict events. And to accomplish that, I'll show you a video that introduces the concept of vulnerable patients. So bear with me as I initiate this video. How is it that an individual can be athletic and active, perhaps running several miles a day, but still suffer a heart attack only the next day? The answer lies in what the following individuals had in common. Former President Clinton, Jim Fix, American icon of marathon runners, and Daryl Kyle, successful Major League Baseball player. All of these people were considered to be vulnerable patients. A vulnerable patient has a 10% or greater risk of having a heart attack in the next 12 months. It is reported that over 1.4 million Americans experience a life-threatening, unpredicted heart attack every year. But by far, the worst aspect of this phenomenon 
is that for between 50 and 60 percent of the men and women who die suddenly from coronary heart disease, death from heart attack is the first symptom. But how would you know if you are a vulnerable patient? Today, it is known that the majority of heart attacks are caused not by the gradual narrowing of the arteries, but by structures called plaques, buildups of cholesterol and fatty deposits in isolated areas of the artery. Though most individuals will live many years with some plaques, the ones of interest are those that have grown unstable, inflamed, and close to rupturing. These are called vulnerable plaques. The challenge lies in locating those plaques that are considered vulnerable and therefore pose an immediate danger to the patient. These vulnerable plaques are inflamed, causing the body's immune system to attack the fat buildup in these plaques as if they are sites of infection. As a result, they are soft and prone to rupture. Upon rupturing, they create a blood clot that suddenly blocks the coronary artery and causes a heart attack. So, how do we currently assess the risk for heart attack? Well, this assessment is an office-based assessment. It is based on the Framheim Heart Study, originating in the 50s, and it's based on basically the values of several variables, your age, total cholesterol, HDL, blood pressure, and smoking. And based on the values of these variables, you receive a 10-year risk. If you have less than 10% 10-year risk, then you're considered to be in the low-risk category. If you have a risk between 10 and 20%, you're in intermediate risk. And if it's more than 20%, you are in the high-risk category. So researchers in the Tulane University, they study the incidence of acute myocardial infarction and also mortality associated with acute myocardial infarction for a period of 20 years. And what they noted is that in the period of 10 years, we have improved in our secondary prevention because the number of people that died after they had a heart attack has been reduced to half. But look at the incidence. We have not improved at all at the ability to predict who is at risk of a heart attack. And those of you who are from engineering background, I think this can give you a hint. If you look at the distribution of cholesterol for people that they do have coronary heart disease, and the distribution of, of cholesterol for the people that they do not have coronary heart disease, you can see that the distributions are partially overlapping. So it's asking a little bit too much to use just these risk markers to differentiate between individuals that are at risk of her having a heart attack based on those who are not at risk of having a heart attack. The truth is that the current risk prediction models are focused on age and the short intermediate absolute risk. So as such, they lose the opportunity to detect the people that they may have low short-term risk, but they have elevated long-term risk. So based on these observations, Dr. Morteza Nagavi, which unfortunately he's not here yet with us, back in the year 2006, he assembled a group of people with a mandate to come up with a plan, a protocol for screening asymptomatic populations. So this is a group of the selected individuals throughout the world. And what they came up with is a new screening protocol for asymptomatic populations. This was published in the journal, American Journal of Cardiology in 2006. And the specific protocol calls for a pyramid of tests. A pyramid of tests going from the less expensive to more expensive, to less invasive to more invasive, to less accurate to more accurate. So in the bottom of the uh, pyramid here, we have the so-called Framheim risk factors. And based on information from all the tests, the group, the so-called SAFE task force, they have come up with a SAFE guideline that allows the classification of individuals in different categories. It includes not only the risk factors, but also imaging tests, such as the coronary artery calcium scoring, and the carotid IMT. I don't have time to go into the details of the guideline, but if you're interested, I'll be happy to give you more details after my talk. So our contribution 
as University of Houston with a SAFE task force is the development of the theoretical framework and computational tools to help physicians score the patient's, the patient's vulnerability and the likelihood of having a future coronary event. Specifically, we're working on two areas. The first area is developing of new risk prediction models that have higher sensitivity and specificity as opposed to current state of the art using the same risk factors. The second area involves discovering imaging-based biomarkers that can improve our predictive ability. Let's talk about this a little bit more and let's look at the bottom of the pyramid here. So as I mentioned, at the bottom of the pyramid, we collect information that is related with the Framingham risk factors. We collect information related to age, sex, smoking habits, and based on statistical techniques that are based on the Cox proportional hazard model, an individual can be classified in one of the three categories. Let's simplify it a little bit. Let's say that the categories that we are interested in is whether we're going to have an event or no event. So it's a prediction model. I'm going to use these variables now to be able to predict an individual will have an event or will not have an event. And when I refer to events, I will have three categories of events. Uh, the first category is coronary heart disease, heart events. This includes myocardial infarction, resuscitated cardiac arrest, and death. We're going to have all the coronary heart disease events, that includes angina. And then we can have cardiovascular events, that includes stroke. And what I want to do is assess the sensitivity and the specificity of this risk prediction model. And in our hands, we have a tremendous resource. It's called multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. This study contains data from 6,800 individuals that at the beginning of the study, in the year 2000, they were free of known cardiovascular disease. And for these individuals, we have a variety of information. We have personal characteristics, prevalent disease measures, information about their uh, intima media thickening, MRI exams, CT exams, but most importantly, we have a follow-up of seven years. And this follow-up allows us to do is to see the progress of the disease over time. Actually, in this cohort, we have about 273 events in the men and about 172 events in the women participating in the study. So when we applied this prediction model, to the data from MESA, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, we came with a, a surprising result. The sensitivity of this test in coronary heart disease heart events is at best 20%. And this number is more or less the same as we look at different events, coronary uh, heart disease, all events, or all the cardiovascular events. In the best case, we're doing 25% for men in all events. So I have, one of the motivations of our group is, can we do better? Can we improve the sensitivity and the specificity of these tests? Our suggestion is to learn from experience. We do that every day. We have a wonderful resource because for all these individuals that they had a heart attack, we know what were their uh, values for these risk factors when the study began. So actually, in computer science, there is a field of study that is called machine learning. And the goal of machine learning is the design and development of algorithms which allow computers to evolve behaviors based on empirical data. It's basically you are using data that you have seen so far to produce a good prediction for future data. And actually, if I want to compare the advantage of machine learning methods over traditional based, uh, statistics based techniques, machine learning methods have the ability to find more complicated structures that is hidden in your data. Some of you actually have seen the benefits of using machine learning today because machine learning is something that is used in the search engines that you use to browse the web. And also in recommender systems, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Netflix. Many of you may know that in the year 2009, actually, Netflix posted a price of $1 million for a group that will come up with a solution that will improve Netflix algorithm for recommending movies. So this group from AT&T basically won the prize, and they were 
relying heavily on machine learning techniques. So in our work, we start with using decision trees. Decision trees is a technique that is used in data mining. And what you do is you represent the data as a tree. And in the nodes of the tree, you have different attributes. And in the leaves, you have your classes, you have your predictions. The branches are basically conjunctions of features that lead to this class label. So if I take the manifesto of all the uh, people that were aboard the Titanic, and I use these three attributes that you see there, I can cluster people that died and people that survived just by answering these three attributes. So what we have done for our work is we have built a new framework, we call it CardioRS, for predicting the occurrence of event or not based on the same risk factors. So notice what we have changed. We have kept the same risk factors that are currently used. We just changed the methodology of how we are going to predict a future event. And when we tried this methodology, we see that now the sensitivity of this test has reached its values of 60%. Uh, when you look at the heart events, when you look at the whole events, and even when you look at the CVDA. One of the measures that we use to compare to uh, tests is the net reclassification index. The net reclassification index, which in our case, when we compare our method versus the traditional from her risk score, gives us about 16% improvement, means that 16% of the times our algorithm was able to elevate to the risk category, to the event category, people that have been misclassified. So we were able to detect 16% of the time people that were incorrectly labeled as low risk that they actually belong to a high risk category. And this is a significant result, as you can see here. But as the SAFE task force has pointed out, you don't need to look only at the risk factors. You have to actually look at the manifestation of the disease. You have to look at tests like the coronary artery uh, calcium score. And you can obtain such measurements if you go in the middle of the pyramid. And the idea is that if you're found to be at risk based on the measurements at the bottom of the pyramid, then you do more specific tests, non-invasive imaging, calcium imaging. And if you are found to be at risk based on these measurements, then you go one level up and you get a more uh, specialized test. So in the middle of the pyramid, we're talking about non-invasive imaging. Uh, computer tomography is such a test. And it's basically an imaging modality that is based on x-ray to give you cross-sectional views of the body. Once you obtain as your region of interest the thoracic cavity at the level of the heart, basically you obtain a set of cross-sectional images, let's say 35 cross-sectional images, that give you an overview of the contents of the thoracic, thoracic cavity. And once you have these images, basically you can see these white spots. These white spots are basically calcified plaques. What I want to bring to your attention is that calcified plaques are known to be a significant biomarker of uh, coronary artery uh, disease. But what complicates things is that when you have a non-contrast computer tomography exam, because of the response of CT in muscle and blood is the same, you can't see where are the different arteries. You, you don't know the location of the arteries, and that's important, and I'll tell you in a minute why. So now, if you count all these white pixels in your exam, you come up with a total calcium score. Okay? This is the amount of calcified plaques in your arteries. What we can do is you can add this parameter as the number of features that you are going to use for your prediction algorithm, and what you get now is improved sensitivity. We have been able to raise the sensitivity if we use this version that uses the calcium score to 60% here, 70% when we talk to all events, and 70% when we talk about CVDA events. But what is significant to see is that this methodology really pans out for the net reclassification index for the case of women. So in the case of women, because we have different models for men and women, in the case of women, we have to have, we, we again, a significant advantage 
in predicting the women that are at risk. Now, I mentioned that the feature that we use is the total calcium score. But as you can see from these two images, you can have calcified plaques that are bunched up together or calcified plaques that are scattered. But this information was not included as part of my model. In addition, you can have two individuals that they have the same calcium score, but they may have calcified plaques all in one artery or calcified plaques in multiple arteries. In general, our collaborators have a number of questions of what other information can we mine from these CT exams. Does it matter if these calcified plaques are heterogeneous or homogeneous? Does it matter if they are scattered or dense? If they are proximal to the ostium or distal? Are they in a bending side of the artery? So on and so forth. So there are a lot of questions that we don't know the answer yet. And to, in order to get a glimpse on these answers, we set out to mine the information in the MESA study. But this requires automatic processing of these uh, 4,000 exams that we have available to extract this kind of information and see if this kind of information adds predictive value. So what we have done is we have developed a framework to automatically process this data. In the first step, we identify candidates for calcium uh, plaques, calcified plaques, and then we are going to find the area of their thoracic cavity. We are going to segment the heart, isolate the heart, find where is the heart in these CT exams, and then also find the aorta, ascending and descending aorta. And based on the information of the, of the heart coordinate system, we are going to predict the areas where are the different coronary arteries. This is important because now when we talk about calcified plaques, we can associate a label. We can associate the label of which artery these calcified plaques belong to. So let's see the steps one by one. So in the world of computer vision of image analysis, the term segmentation means that I'm interested to put labels in pixels that differentiate between different depicted objects. So the goal here was from this set of images to come up with a segmentation of the thoracic cavity. I want to isolate what's inside the thoracic cavity. And to solve this problem, we, we cast it as an optimal surface segmentation problem. And then once I have created this segmentation, then I want to look inside the thoracic cavity and find out the pixels that correspond to the heart. Okay, I want, this is the um, area of interest. However, the problem of segmentation in medical image analysis, in image analysis in general, is ill-posed. And usually what we do is we develop additional constraints to help the segmentation process. In medical image analysis, we have additional information that we want to take advantage. And let me share some examples of this additional information. So suppose I have this non-contrast CT exam, and my goal is to label the pixels that belong to the heart, that depict the heart. What prior knowledge can I bring to bear? Well, since I know that basically the heart contains heart muscle and blood, then they have a specific appearance, and also they are spatial contiguous. That's one piece of information that I would like to use. I also know that the heart is inside the thoracic region. That's a second piece of information. And the third piece of information is that I know that the heart is located uh, between the lungs. So what we have done is we have developed a method that all these knowledge driven constraints are incorporated in maximum a posteriori Markham Randall field framework to solve the segmentation problem. So the output of this process incorporating these constraints is a labeling of the pixels that belong to the heart. Well, the problem is not so easy. Because if you look at the appearance of the tissues above the diaphragm and below the diaphragm, it's very similar. Okay. So in this uh, algorithm, we have used only appearance information, the texture. How do the texture of the organ looks like? So it was expected that our results will um, leak in this area, it will not have an accurate result. The way we solve this problem is to take advantage of the fact that we know the shape of the heart. We can use prior information, we have built a statistical shape model of the heart, and we can use this information to constrain our set of solutions. So 
In this case, we are able to avoid this leakage of the segmentation process and correctly identify the location of the heart. Now that we have the heart, what we can do is we can place a coordinate system. That allows us to compare data among different individuals because the heart is the central point that we want to focus. And actually, it turns out if you look at the heart coordinate system and you map out where are the different arteries, we observe the pattern. We observe that based on the location of the coronary arteries, if we map them in this coordinate system, we can actually construct maps that tells us where the coronary arteries are bound to be based on anatomical considerations. So basically, this is the volumetric representation, and this is the slice-by-slice -slice consideration going from proximal to medium to distal. And based on where the calcified plaque is in each of these colored regions, we can assign a label. So now we have additional information. Not only we know the amount of calcium when you have a calcified plaque, but we know which artery is associated with. And that's a very powerful information because we know for a fact, for example, that if you have a calcified plaque in, in your uh, LDA, that's a risk factor. Now, as I said, using these methods that we have developed based on machine learning methods, we are able to associate labels, associate the name of the artery that the calcified plaques belong to. But we can do it not only for the coronary arteries, but also for the aorta. So the information is there. We have a non-contrast CT exam. The way we extracted information for the heart, we can actually locate the aorta. We can locate the ascending and descending aorta. So you don't have additional radiation. You have done the exam once. How can we tease additional information? By extracting the aorta now, we can find all the calcified plaques that are associated with the aorta and give them proper labels. How we do that? Well, we start with an initialization process that is based on a regression framework, based on the intensity features, and we can localize approximately where to find the uh, ascending aorta, where to find the descending aorta, and then we track these detection results over the stack of slices that we want to work, and we get an initial area. Once we get this initial area, we can unwrap the data in this initial area, put them into the so-called polar domain, and basically refine our estimation of the surface of the aorta. And you can see the result that we have obtained here. The third piece of information that we can get from the same non-contrast exam is the thoracic fat. And that's the fat around your heart. And some of you might question, why do you need to undergo a non-contrast CT exam to find out the amount of fat of your heart and not just look the size of your belt? Well, it turns out there are a lot of lean people that they have, uh, let's say, significant fat around their heart. So we know that fat is a biomarker of inflammation, and we wanted to be able to include this piece of information. So the challenge now is, from a non-contrast CT exam, come up with a segmentation. Again, segmentation, remember, label. We want to find labels for these pixels that correspond to fat. How do we solve this problem? Actually, we created an ensemble of classifiers that classify different C tissues. And by fusing these results from ensemble of classifiers, we are able to come up with a classification of the pixels that belong to the uh, fat in the thoracic cavity. Why is this important? Because this gives us additional imaging-based biomarkers that we can put in our prediction algorithm and check whether they offer additive predictive value. Of course, I mentioned only one test, correct? I talked about only what you can get from a non-contrast CT exam. But there is a variety of tests, carotid IMT, ankle breaking index. And of course, there is work that needs to be done to see what is the additive predictive value of this test for predicting heart attacks. Now, I told you that we are talking about a pyramid of tests. That means that if you are found to be at risk at this level of the pyramid, then you move one level up. You move at the level of the intravascular ultrasound. Intravascular ultrasound 
is nothing else but ultrasound inside your arteries. So this is a cross-section of your artery. You can see here, this is the catheter. This is the location of the catheter. Here is the lumen where the blood flows. And this area here is the vessel wall. So using intravascular ultrasound, basically you can see, understand the morphology of a vessel. So you can find where is the lumen, where is the intima media interface, and also the media adventitia interface. And there was a lot of work in the literature to extract information related to plaques from this kind of modalities. We looked at the morphology of the vessel. There is a commercial product from Volcano that looks to characterize different tissues, and it's called virtual histology because they seek to do it using imaging data without uh, actually slicing the arteries. And there are works that look basically at the temperature of a plaque, or they look at the spectrum. There's work that looks at the endothe endothelial uh, profile, so on and so forth. All these methods have a single goal, to differentiate between active and inflamed plaques versus inactive and non-inflamed plaques. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, all of us have plaques. The trick is find out the ones that are active and inflamed so you can uh, administer proper therapy. So back in 2005, we pioneered a new method of research. It's called vasovasorum imaging. What we wanted to do is we wanted to extract an additional piece of information, functional information from this morphological modality. And it was based on a simple observation. What is the vas vasorum? This vas vasorum is these small vessels that feed the vessel wall. And you can see here the density of this vas vasorum when you have a normal artery. But in the case where you have a diseased artery, in the case that you have atherosclerosis, you have increased density. And we wanted to be able to capitalize on this observation. The reason is that the vas vasorum density is directly related to the metabolic activity and the inflammation in the plaques. So if you have large inflamed plaques, then you have higher vasovasorum density. If you have old fibrocalcified plaques, then you have the least vasovasorum density. And let me show you some of the images of these microvessels. Here you can see a beautiful image from a scanning electron microscope that sees this, shows this network of microvessels. And here is a histology image, and you can see the cross section. These are the cross sections of these small vessels. So the biology is known, correct? If we have uh, oxygen diffusion, oxygen diffusion is only adequate for about 40 cell layers in a normal artery. So if you have any structure that is thicker than that, that will require active blood transport, and this is accomplished via the vasovasorum. So if you have a plaque that grows several millimeters in thickness, this plaque must promote Deep, pla deep plaque angiogenesis. It must promote the formation of new vessels, the vas vasorum. But these vessels are fa fragile and they leak, so it promotes hemorrhage. So the fact is that vas vasorum density correlates with plaque inflammation and activity. And can, this measure can be used to measure not only disease progression, but also disease regression. Here is a, a beautiful art, uh, image of an, a pig artery without any uh, increased density of the vas vasorum. And here's what happens if you administer high cholesterol diet. You can see that the density increases. And this is the result when you administer uh, statins after the high cholesterol diet. So you can use vas vasorum density as a marker of progression of disease and also regression of disease. So the question we pose to ourselves is, is it possible using existing equipment that is currently being used? We are not interested to develop new catheters because it will take five to 10 years before we get an FDA approval. Using existing car catheters, can we detect in vivo vasovasorum? And the answer is yes. So we develop a new protocol that basically involves placing an intravascular catheter inside the artery, finding an area of interest, usually an area where you have minimal lumen, and then you inject a contrast agent. And then the contrast agent basically reaches the vas vasorum and sadly, sadly illuminates it. Think of it like this. Imagine that 
I'm examining aerial images. And I want to find the roads. For me, the roads is the vessel zone, correct? It's the vessels. If I want to analyze aerial images to find the roads, that's a very difficult task. So instead of looking for the roads, maybe I look for the cars. Because the cars are moving, they have additional information, I can use the motion to find the cars. So if you assume that the cars are moving on the roads, which we know it's not true in Texas, but let's assume that the cars are moving on the roads, then by detecting the cars, I found where are the roads. This is what's happening here. I'm injecting a contrast agent. So I'm taking images before the injection of the contrast agent. I'm injecting the contrast agent. And then I'm looking, where did my contrast agent go? So the places where my contrast agent went, that's where I have Vasa Vazorum. So actually, we developed a software that will analyze these contrast-enhanced sequences. And the principle is rather simple, as I'll say. You have an image before, you have an image after. You can subtract, and you can find differential imaging. You can see the differences. Well, things will be easier if things were not moving, if things were static. But in the scenario I'm describing to you, everything is moving. Your artery is moving, your catheter is moving as a result of the blood flow. So although you think that your catheter is collecting data from this orange rectangle here, in reality, it's collecting data from a much broader spectrum of tissue. So you cannot really subtract things. You cannot subtract apples and oranges. So what we have to do is we had to develop methods that will stabilize the image sequence first select only the frames from the, the areas that we're interested, and then use these uh, frames for analysis. To give you an example, let's play this, this sequence on the left. Bear with me. OK. If the video was playing, you will see that there is relative motion of the catheter with respect to the wall, and the results of the analysis stabilize this image sequence. I'm sorry that it's not playing, so I'll move to the next one. So the result of our analysis actually is a visualization that points in the areas where we have detected vasa vasorum, but also we have quantitative information about the perfusion. This information basically points to the size of the vasa vasorum vessels, and it's very important information. So allow me to play a video that summarizes these ideas. Groups of researchers at the Computational Biomedicine Laboratory at the University of Houston, the University of Athens, Columbia University, and Aarhus University, in collaboration with the Association for Eradication of Heart Attack, have developed a new technique for detection of vulnerable plaques called vasovasorum imaging. Vasovasorum are networks of microvessels that feed the walls of arteries. Research suggests that a greater proliferation of vasovasorum in a plaque is a clear indicator of plaque inflammation and vulnerability to rupture. The group is at work perfecting a technology that aims to effectively and safely pinpoint the location of vulnerable plaques and, more importantly, a system that will measure and quantify the vulnerability of each plaque. Researchers in the Computational Biomedicine Laboratory are in charge of developing the algorithms and software for analyzing the imaging data. The Screening for Heart Attack Prevention and Education Task Force, or the SHAPE Task Force, of the Association for the Eradication of Heart Attack suggests a new non-invasive screening process that identifies high-risk individuals. However, identification of vulnerable plaques is pending on the success of the new invasive techniques. The new vasovasorum screening technique uses a technology known as intravascular ultrasound. Intravascular ultrasound is a safe, widely used technology which provides detailed views of the interior of human blood vessels. The process works in several steps. An ultrasound catheter is placed in a vessel of interest, usually one close to a suspicious plaque area in an artery. Gas-filled nanobubbles are then injected into the vessels and absorbed by the vasovasorum, illuminating them under ultrasound so that they can be analyzed by a physician. If extensive vasovasorum growth is detected, 
This could be an indicator of plaque vulnerability. Using vasovasorum imaging developed by the University of Houston and its collaborators, doctors will be better equipped to locate vulnerable plaques before they have an opportunity to rupture and cause a heart attack. So actually we have ongoing clinical studies in uh, Hippocratian Hospital in Greece and here you can see real clinical images from a patient where you can clearly see the presence of vasovasorum in this individual and intervention was decided based on the measurements of our system. In addition to these ongoing clinical studies, actually we are performing uh, histology validation using pig and uh, pig data and here you can see histology, this is a cross section of the tissue where you have manually marked the boundaries of the lumen and the boundary of the vessel wall and in red we have the cross sections of the vasa vasorum. So when we compare the results of the histology with the results of the software, this is the results of the histology and here is the results of the software, we, can, we have seen strong correlation. Again, I want to caution you, this is uh, preliminary results, we don't have statistical power yet, but it points that we are in the right direction in, in, in solving this problem. So what I have presented to you here today is basically the efforts of the computational biomedicine lab, along with our collaborations with the SAPE task force, in developing two lines of thought. The first is new prediction models that will have higher sensitivity and specificity, and the other is discovering new imaging-based biomarkers. So when I think of the scientific challenges that lie ahead, sometimes I think of the long traveler in the Middle Ages that stopped in a place where three people were working by the side of the road. So the traveler asked the first worker what he was doing, and the worker replied that he was shaping a rock. The traveler asked the second worker what he was doing, and the worker replied that he was building a wall. Then the traveler asked the third worker what he was doing, and the third man replied that he was building a cathedral. So in a similar sense, although we're not building a cathedral, I think you'll agree with me that what we are doing in our efforts towards eradicating heart attack are similar in long-lasting value, and there is an urgent need to educate our society about the risks of cardiovascular disease. So will you join us in eradicating heart attacks? Thank you.